Welcome, everybody. Welcome to week 30 of the Sephardi Chabura. Uh, for those who are joining us for the first time, uh, the Sephardi Chabura is a virtual and global Beth Midrash dedicated to a uh, classical Sephardi approach to Torah. Uh, to stay in touch about our classes and projects, please direct message me your number or your email address, and we'll uh, get you in touch with the WhatsApp groups and the email threads. Uh, we're very grateful to the wonderful SCA, also known as the Sephardi Community Alliance uh, out in America, uh, who are fundamental in making today's Chabura possible. Uh, for more information about the SCA, I recommend everyone to check out their website, uh, scaupdates.org. Moving on to tonight's show, there's not so much housekeeping this week. Uh, the next edition of the journal will be pleased God in a couple months time. We're just getting the essays in today from the Tamidim, uh, essays in the next few weeks from the Tamidim. Uh, but to tonight's show, I want to provide some context. Uh, when we sent out a survey to the Talmudim a few months ago, one of the most popular requests request that we had actually received was a desire to learn more about Sephardi approaches to studying Talmud. And this is the topic that we'll be exploring uh, with our special guest tonight, uh, Rabbi Harold Sutton. Uh, Rabbi Sutton received semicha from Hacham Ovadia Yosef, Hacham Shimon Aluf, and Hacham Meir Mazuz. He earned a degree in psychology from Yeshiva University and studied towards a master's degree in Judaic studies at New York University. Rabbi Sutton is the Rosh Hashiva of Magen David Yeshiva, Rosh Hashiva of the Sephardic Rabbinical College and the Rabbi of Congregation Hochmah Masar. Rabbi Sutton is also a mentor and colleague of our Rosh Bet Midrash, Rabbi Joseph Dweck. And it's truly an honor to have such a Talmud Hacham give shiur to our global cohort of Talmudim here at the Chaburah. Uh, I myself was introduced to Rabbi Sutton a few years ago by Rabbi Dweck, my Rebbe, and I immediately went on YouTube and the SCA website to be able to watch uh, some of Rabbi Sutton's shurim. And I really can't tell you the joy that I felt uh, to come across a Talmud Hacham who was giving not only insightful shurim on Machshava, the most insightful, the most detailed areas of halacha, uh, but then you'll see a shur and a series of shurim comparing the approaches of Hastei Kreshkash, Harambam, and many other of our beloved Hachamim. So for me, and I'm sure for the rest of the Chabura, it's really, really honored to have you here, Rabbi Sutton. Thank you for being with us, and Bachabot, the stage is yours. Thank you for having me. It's uh, truly an honor to be able to present and to have a, a discussion on this topic. Um, so I wanna comment first thing on uh, what you said is that it, you, said, you said it in this way, I don't know if you said it on purpose, Sephardic approach is to Gemara, and uh, that's an important, um, important thing to notice. Um, I'll, I'll give a brief overview uh, historically, but um, it's not a monolithic thing that there's a Sephardic approach to learning Talmud. Over history, there were many different ones recorded in different manners, and uh, there's, there's and things have developed. I'll be presenting one one specific type of approach that I was able to study from my teachers and mentors. And, um, but I'll be mentioning others. And as I understand, you'll probably have different lecturers on the topic that may present different approaches um, and equally legitimate and equally part of our Svaradi heritage. Um, in general, when we talk about learning, right? And specifically learning Gemara, we use different terms today. There's, 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 people who talk about bikiut, right? Which is generally the ability to learn a lot of material, albeit not such in depth, but quickly. And then there is what we call harifut, which is a, a very analytical approach, um, which seems to be a very in-depth approach. And we'll analyze that a little bit. And then there is what we call sometimes the, 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 uh, the concept, which, is, which we'll discuss, the concept of ayyun. Yun is an in-depth approach, which um, has a merger of many different approaches. And we'll see as we go through it, what the distinctions of are, of Bikiut, Harifut, and Yun. I also want to distinguish that as we talk about um, a Sephardic approach to learning Gemara, we should distinguish that with the Sephardic, with, we should distinguish that with the Sephardic approach to learning Halakha. Um, sometimes that's, and I, I mentioned this because sometimes that, that line is blurred. People assume that, oh, Svaradim learn Gemara, just Alibadi Hilchitab. But that's not true. Um, 
there is an important place for the learning of halakha with the sugyot and the Bet Yosef, and it's a separate discussion. We're going to talk about an analyst, a specific way of analyzing a sukya. Okay. Um, historically, right, and if we go back, you know, almost let's take a little bit of a, uh, a historical trip, and we'll go back almost to the uh, little bit after the conclusion of the writing of the Talmud. Um, the first people who wrote, who studied, who learned, right, almost at its completion were the Sporaim and later the Geonim. And they had a very specific methodology of learning the sugya. And, um, you know, and based on that Limud, you know, we have the Rif was educated in that manner, his student, the Rimigash, and his student, student, the Rambam, the greatest. And Rambam writes a lot about his methodology of learning Talmud and the approach of understanding a sugya and you know, Rambam's words to be, to be able to derive the ultimate halakha out of the sugya, which seems to be a lot of the focus that he discusses. And the, at, at his time, learning Talmud and learning the Al-Fasi, the Rif, and learning the Hibur were different studies and not everyone approached the Talmud, right? And it was a highly academic level of learning. And that approach, which is coined many times, the Andalusian approach or the, the um, ancient Sephardic approach is, a, is very important to delve into and to understand and to really get our appreciation of that core value of Talmud Gemara, because these, this comes from our core um, foundations of our faith, our foundations of our halakha, our foundations of almost everything, the Geonim and the uh, Spanish Hachamim to the great Tarambam. And uh, we're not going to be, although a lot of what we're saying is going to be impacted heavily by such an approach, but I'm not going to be exclusively talking about that. Um, in Spain, a change seemed to have happened around the time of Nahmanides, the time of the Ramban. The Ramban imported the, the French method of learning um, from the Tosafot, which is comparative analysis of sukyot and learning different sukyot and comparing them and questioning them and uh, using question and answer methodologies and a certain type of early form of a pilpul. And he introduces that approach in his yeshiva into Spain. And there's this merger at this point between that approach and the Ramban and his Hidushim, you'll see it's very similar to uh, Tosfot and his Talmidim, the Rashba and later the Ritba, seem to have some form of a attempt to merge two approaches into one with a strong leaning to a to the French system of learning and the Tosafot system of learning. Uh, at the same time, and this is going to be the, an important approach, um, in, within the Spanish circle, um, specifically with Deran and others in that area, um, a, a, what, what I'll call an analytical approach to Talmud develops, and this is best pointed down and written and summarized in a very small book, Derech Talmud, by the B. Yitzhak Kampanton. Now, his approach is going to be very important to what we're talking about today, because it's that approach that sums to the foundation of some of the methods that we're going to talk about learning um, this afternoon. Um, he focused very strongly on the importance of language, the importance of semantics, and, um, and he introduced that approach into learning of Talmud. And that approach is, is a, a bit of a foundation of a lot of what we're going to talk today. Um, if anyone is interested in an article about understanding that approach, there is an article in English, as far as I remember, um, on Rubiz Hakan Panton, written by uh, Daniel Bayara. Um, don't know the name of it, but I'm, I'm, there, there is a work on that. Um, and everyone's interested, it is 
it would be helpful. Um, if you're interested to further do some further reading on this topic, I'm gonna to suggest a few things as well, um, uh, other further readings as we go on. And then leads What's us- What's the name again? The Yard? Daniel Boyaron, Daniel Boyaron. Um, uh, and that cuts us to the point of the, uh, of the uh, more modern methods of learning. Um, and the ones that are applied in yeshiva today. Um, so I already mentioned this concept of bikiyut and iyun, in terms of bikiyut and harifut and iyun, in terms of different approaches, and they're usually classified on that term. Some are more bikiyut, some are more considered bikiyut. In terms of analytical methods, the overwhelming majority of yeshiva today whether they are attended by Sephardic students or by Ashkenazic students, generally approach the Talmud with an Ashkenazic methodology. And there are a number of them. There's uh, the Polish methodology of Pupul, which is a uh, it's a highly theoretical approach where questions and answers are, are created and new theories are developed. There is the, and I'm certainly not uh, competent really to speak on these. Um, there is, of course, the method that was created by Reb Chaim of Brisk, right? Um, which was, although very different than the approach of the Nitziv of Velazhin, but he taught it in the Velazhin Yeshiva for a while. Davka the Nitziv, if anyone is interested in reading up on, uh, on the Nitziv, in his approach to Talmud, you'll be surprised that he has not such a different approach to then the approach that what we're gonna talk about. It was even uh, applied in, by certain great Ashkenazic rabbis, the, the Gra, the Nitziv being one of them. And if anyone's interested in his, his, his approach, a good place to start to look into the Nitziv is uh, the writings of his nephew, uh, Rav Baruch Epstein in Mekor Baruch. He has a volume, the last volume of his, about the Nitziv and how he uh, studied Torah and taught Torah in the Yeshiva of Velazhin. It's Art Scroll did a translation of it called My Uncle the Nitziv in that, uh, and uh, it's a valuable work to actually see the Nitziv. Um, and that's just to show, I, I digress on this because um, what the approach that we're talking about was used by, you know, there were some more um, Ashkenazim who focused linguistically and learned that way and uh, it should be an interesting uh, idea to show that there was, there was that approach and if someone would like to further read on that. But in terms of the Bresca model, the Bresca model is usually created in terms of a very abstract way of learning. Um, questions are created and contradictions are solved and the, the learning focuses on the abstract concepts that can be developed out of the words and the ideas are developed these abstract concepts and, and building blocks to come up with these larger ideas from the within the word hidden within the words of the Talmud um, and we'll see we'll contrast that to some of the approach we're talking about and it was one of the big critiques sometimes Sfaradim are do such a thing is um, they always often like to say Right? They don't. They didn't come to create riddles that you should have to decode to create these large abstractions. They they said what they meant, and and, and we'll, that's going to be one of the um, approaches that we're going to talk about, and one of the principles that we're going to talk about. Um, so the approach I'd like to take and discuss is the approach which sometimes uh, it's a misnomer that's used for it. It's sometimes called unitunizai, but it's really not that it's really an approach that um, if you look at the works of many Middle Eastern hachamim throughout, um, throughout the Middle East and North Africa, it's an approach that's how Talmud was taught. One of the reasons why they call it Yuna Tunzai is because the main proponent of that is the Yeshivat Kisera Hamim and um, the great Rosh Yeshiva, the Gadol, Rabbi Meir Mazuz, who is a, a, a proponent of this methodology, who studied this methodology, who writes many compendiums on many different Masechtot and Shas based on this methodology, who studied from his father and his rabbis uh, throughout generations and who are perfected the teaching of it. 
and uh, it's being taught in some yeshivot, but it should be noted that there are many different countries, you know, it, it's not so different from the approach of a Hamazati and Frat Yosef or many other hachamim in different uh, yeshivot. There are nuanced differences, but it's important to understand that this was not specifically something to one country, but um, really was taught in many different places. And I'd like to go over some important principles, foundational principles of, 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 of that learning. And a lot of what we're going to talk about, we're gleaning from um, the right, some of the writings of Rabbi Mazuz. Um, he has a, uh, three articles on this topic in, called Darke Ha'iyun, um, printed numerous times, most recently in a book called Kobex Ma'amarim, where the first three articles are about Darke Ha'iyun. And we're going to base ourselves a lot on what he has to say, as well as some other approaches, and I'll try and quote to them when we get to them. And I'll try and end off, like I said, with some reading material. Um, so some of the principles. First important principle that we need to understand is that the, and this is sort of what I hinted at, that the hachamim did not come to create riddles. That there is no missing language in the Gemara, in Rashi, or in Tosfot. There's no riddles. And there's nothing missing. Everything is complete. And just as there's nothing missing that needs to be decoded, there's also nothing extra. The rabbi spoke with extreme brevity. So every word needs to be understood. And there's, you, you can't skip a word. You can't just say, oh, I don't know what that's doing there. Every single word has a place. And every single word needs to be understood why it's there. But again, in its, in its simple, in its, in, its, in its most analytical way to understand what these words are doing there, without trying to create some abstraction of something that's not in front of you. So the reading of the words are important exactly on those two points. One, that we, we, don't, we, don't, uh, we don't think anything's extra, but we also don't think that there's something missing. The text is a complete total unit, which needs to be analyzed from all its components nothing left out and nothing added. It's almost like, I would say metaphorically, right? You're not allowed to be mosif anything, but you're not allowed to be goraya. Every word's important and please don't add anything into the text. Um, and that's, it. that's a key component to understand that. Another concept which is important, which is that of uh, necessity. Um, and I'll describe what I mean. It's not just that every word needs to be understood, but we need to understand why the author spoke in the way he spoke. Why did he choose that language? And why did he need to say what he had to say? Very often this is termed as right? What is bothering? Why did he need to say it? And why did he formulate in that way? And this happens very often in Rashi, when there were times it seems to be that Rashi, who, when they, of course, a key structure of learning the sukya is understanding Rashi properly. And I'll digress for a minute. The approach that we're talking about, first, the sukya needs to be learned on its own merit, separately and understood. At which point you do your best to understand, and then you will approach Rashi as a, a shita on it. And if you'll see, many times you'll understand because you've approached Rashi that way and you've approached the sugya first, you can understand Rashi in greater depth. So very often in the yeshivot, sometimes you learn Gemara and you run to Rashi to figure out how to, as an as a, as a explanation. And sometimes that is true. Sometimes that's a, a necessity. But more a, a, a more healthier way of doing it is to understand the sugya to the best of your ability and then to approach Rashi and see what Rashi adds to understanding of the sugya, and your approach to Rashi will be much greater. And a lot of times we want to understand why Rashi said something in the way he said it. If there seems to be an extra word, let's analyze it. What forced him to say what he said? So there were two concepts. What was ukshalo? What bothered him in the sugya? And then when we understand that, what was his hechreah? Why did he explain it that way? I'll give an example to this. There is a Gemara in Masichet Berachot. 
דף ס"ב. And the Gemara says, the Gemara tells us, it's not such a, you know, it's a little bit of a topic that gets a little people queasy, but it says when after one goes to the bathroom, the obligation is to uh, clean oneself, right, with his left hand and not with his right hand. And the Gemara says, Why doesn't one clean himself with his right hand? And the Gemara answers, because that's the hand that you use to tie the tefillin. Okay. Now Rashi comments. And Rashi says something which seems to add nothing. Rashi says, You use the right to tie the tefillin, which we already learned from the Sukhya, on your left arm. What is added here in this Rashi, right? You use your right hand to tie your tefillin, and that's what the Gemara says, and Rashi repeats that, and he says on your left arm. What, what, is, the, what, is, what, what, is, what is Rashi doing? Why did Rashi have to add that? What is bothering Rashi to say that? What is missing in the Gemara? So I think, right, when you look at it, when I was a kid, and I think almost every person who learns the sugya has one simple question that you, you, you have to clean. You can't clean with your right hand because that's the hand you use to tie the tefillin. So everyone has this question. And maybe someone here in the audience has the question on that gemara. If anyone could ask. Maybe it's because you actually have the tefillin on the other hand. Right. So everyone has that question. It's excellent. What are you talking about? You... You can clean with your left. That's the hand that actually has the tefillin on it. So that she understood that and he automatically corrected that understanding. Shekosher batfilin bizroa smolo. You clean with your hand. Which hand is connected to the tefillin? Only the right. Because the tefillin is not on the left hand. It's on the left arm. So you tie your tefillin on your left arm, but it's the right hand that's connected to the tefillin, which ties it on the left arm. So you might think, well, why should you clean with your left? That's closer to the Not at all, because the main bulk of the Kedusha of the tefillin is on the arm, not on the hand. And so therefore, Rashi is careful. That's why he says, Shekosher bat tefillin, not biyad, biyad smolo, but bizroa smolo. And therefore, Rashi is anticipating a question and within that word or two has automatically answered it. The paying attention to the extra word, understanding what it's doing there, why it's there, and what is gained from that extra word is a crucial component to understanding the sugya properly. And by the way, we benefit here because now we understand the halacha that's brought by a later authority named the Shla Kadosh. And he says, oh, by the way, when you, when you clean your hand with your left hand, try not to use your middle finger. Why not? Because the tefillin is on that middle finger. So idea that may come from this understanding of Rashi, that the idea is that the reason you could clean it with your left hand is because that's the hand um, that is not in touch with the tefillin. And if you'll ask, don't we tie it on that? We tie it on the zrawa. And so, again, uh, leave the merits of the argument, yes or no. We, we can have that discussion if that's, you know, which is better. But it's clear we understand something that she is coming to tell us in a few words. Now, again, we didn't create a riddle out of it. We didn't create an abstraction out of the word. We didn't build a, a whole component on it. We simply looked at the word. We said, the word is here to teach me something. It says zrawa. Why does it say zrawa? We understood a problem with the sugya and what forced Rashi to solve it and how he solved it. And this is the idea that I mentioned of necessity, that everything is necessary to be there. There's nothing extra. And we need to understand how but still focusing on the pshat component of the word itself. Um, and as saying that, as I mentioned before, words and their meanings. 
The words are building blocks of the sugya, and therefore every word is crucial to understand the text that you are reading. Um, uh, and, and this idea, which we mentioned of Maukshalo, is brought down by uh, Rabbi Tzhak and Panton. And he says, once you enter, understand all the words and then the concepts, now ask what is beneath and what is being taught to be by the words. Uh, another crucial component is, um, which is brought into understanding, and this is specifically um, in other Rishonim, but it can actually sometimes be used in Rashi, certainly in the Sugya itself it's important, is very often there's a series of questions and answers, right? Especially when you get into authorities like Tosafot, and when you study them, you understand that they bring a question, and then all of a sudden, they give an answer. And they are mehadesh something. They make a new idea based on those questions and answers. It is important when you deal with those questions and answers to two, two things. One, what is the core change? What was understood differently from the question to the answer? In other words, you'll have a question. Very often says, right? It's not well, why do we do this? And we'll say, because we do it. In other words, some essence of, of change in the mentality of the answerer that he changed some concept that the questioner understood. Now, sometimes it's obvious. He, he thought the sugya meant this, and now he understands the sugya means this. But sometimes they'll ask a question and they'll seem to give some arbitrary answer. And so what was the questioner thinking? How did he understand the sugya? How did he relate to the sugya in the mentality of his questioning? And how did the person who's answering it um, answer the sugya? Now, it's important to understand that because very often, and not illegitimately, we understand the terms of the questions and answers almost rhetorical, right? And there is a legitimacy to understanding that sometimes, but we can't fall back on that. Many times there's some core switch, and especially when it comes to the Rishonim that it's made. Right? Within the Gemara, we can apply the two, but sometimes you'll see there is rhetorical and rhetoric understanding in the Talmud, but certainly in the Rishonim, and very often in the Tosafot, what changed when you studied, when you read the question, and when you read the answer, what was that, what we call Merkaz HaTerutz? Nikudata teruts, that actually that one component change, that is crucial to understanding it properly. And then when you completed that, how is the sugya learned differently? It is important when one completes a Rishonim or Tosafot and you get your questions and answers, well, how does the sugya flow now? Sometimes the sugya will flow the same, but just different conclusions. But sometimes the sugya will change and it will flow differently. It is important to go back to the original text that created this situation and bring it back inside. We do not want to just have a theoretical discussion external to the sugya, which creates all sorts of conclusions without figuring it out how it works back itself within the text. Okay. Um, uh, Rabbi Meir Mazuz elaborates on a lot of these topics and another component that he is a big fan of, which is writing. That the student must learn to write, to write Hidushim and to understand, and that helps him understand the sugya and communicate the sugya. And that is a key component. Um, some of the, the do nots, right? Some of the things of, that we need to avoid are forced interpretations. In other words, you have a question. So they often say, sometimes the question is a question, but a forced interpretation of the sugya or because of the question that, that sometimes creates a warped view of what's understanding it. Sometimes not all questions we have every single answer to. And that's an important idea um, uh, to, to understand. Um, rather than to just create abstractions in, in the uh, in the sugya, I want to close with another component of this today, which is something I didn't mention. 
but it's something that we should be aware of. Um, I mentioned different approaches to learning today. Uh, another approach which uh, has some bearing on what we're talking about is what we call today the academic approach to learning, right? The academic approach to Talmud, very often taught in uh, you know, a critical theory of understanding of Talmud, and very often taught in many universities when you take courses in Talmud, and very often um, there's a lot of interesting thoughts and ideas that are brought in, but very often when we hear that approach, what's lacking is any commitment to the sanctity of the text, to understanding of the text from where it came from, but there are some benefits that are added. And some of the benefits might be a historical understanding of the sugya, right? Um, where it came from, authorship of the sugya, and um, a lot of the development and the background. Um, that very often in the traditional yeshiva setting is somewhat ignored. Um, so you have these two approaches, this academic approach, which creates some problems for a, uh, a committed student of learning Torah. And, um, and on the other hand, uh, what happened here? We can still see you and hear you. You can still see me. So I'm gonna talk, but I don't see anybody. I don't know what oh. happened here, but I don't know. Okay, I'm not sure, but as long as you can still see me, that'll be fine. Okay, um, so when I mentioned that, uh, the idea of, of, of what we're talking about, Iyun, has a lot of benefits. As I mentioned, this academic approach, which has its own problems, but cre gives us benefits which are somewhat in the traditional yeshiva model of learning ignored, history, language, grammar, authorship, many of those concepts. But I wanna show you that the approach that we're advocating at this moment has some of those benefits embedded into it in the traditional model. And many times, many times, a Hacham Sifaradi when he's teaching will see a sugya and he'll analyze of what, you know, the Bala Mimra, and this Bala Mimra has came from this school of thought. And, um, and, and, and understanding that Bala Mimra and where he came from. And, th and that's important. While Tosafot strives many times to unite all the sugyot, sometimes, and this is even traditional, we see it in Rabbeinu Hananel and early Rishonim, they'll understand what they have sugyot harukot, sugyot sotrot, because they came from different backgrounds, different yeshivot, different, you know, uh, um, students of different yeshivot have, would follow different shitot, and not every sugya needs to coalesce with every other sugya. Um, and so a lot of that critical theory is actually brought in in the, in the traditional method of learning. And that's very, very important to understand because in general, Sferadim never saw that dichotomy between the world of, of uh, the yeshiva and the outer world of the university. And in, in learning also, we find a, a similar, um, uh, a similar uh, ability to merge the two. Uh, I'll give you um, one example, uh, which may help. Um, there is a, there is a, a Gemaran Ketubot that says, right? On that, that you are, we don't force him to give straw to the behema, but we do to his cattle, to his bakad. So on that, Rashi says that bakad is female and that the behemoth are the male animals. And every and people ask on this session, that does, doesn't make sense. Opposite, behema is a feminine language and bakad is a, uh, is a masculine. And so how would we use behema for the male animals and bakad for the female animals. So what do we do? When we look into the reef, we see that the reef had the exact opposite girsa, had the opposite version. In kofin teven lifne bekaro, aval kofeli ten teven lifne behemto. So you see that the reef 
version fits that you that the you, um, you don't force to give the, the straw to the bakad, which is the masculine, which is the masculine, but you do force him to feed what the behema, which is the feminine. Okay, so okay, the reef is fine, but what about Rashi? So Rabbi Mazu's claim here is that Rashi really that that Rashi heard his perush based on the girsa of the reef. He received the commentary based on the girsa of the reef, but he himself had a different girsa. So what if we want to now uncover historically what happened? We have Rashi with the girsa of the reef. With, I'm sorry, with the commentary of the Reef, trying to fit it in the alternate Gersa, and that's what created the problem. So here you have a critical approach to understand based on Gersa, based on versions of the Talmud, based on development. All this seems to be uh, what we see today only in the university world, but in a traditional model, which is helping us to understand the problem that we had in Rashi, contrasting it with the Reef, looking at ancient Girsaot, looking at the development of a perush, and all within the approach of traditional learning. So it's an interesting concept that we have here that, um, that we're, we're seeing the ideas of, of, of Talmud as it's taught in, the, um, in, the, uh, in, in, in some of the universities, but we actually have a benefit of it included in the methodology of learning. So that's another example. And I tried not to, you know, I promised the rabbi I wouldn't bring burden with too many examples, just an overview. Um, but I, I wanted to show some of the benefits of that approach. Now, it is very difficult to make sense of what I just did because uh, the approach, you know, really needs to be studied to be fully formulated and understood. I, I could lecture here and I could probably give another four or five more lectures just on the topic of this topic of how we learn and methodology of our yun. And we could do that. But I have to say, um, and I was a little unsure about the lecture because I felt that I would not be able to do justice and I would not be able to transmit it or translate it properly unless it's taught. I remember when I was young and I was trying to understand this methodology and I read the article, I just, many of the articles of Rabbi Mazuz, I read them maybe, we aren't exaggerating, 30, 40 times. And um, uh, I spent a lot of time, but until I spent many, many days, weeks, years applying it to the sugya, I really couldn't fully grasp it. So, um, what we tried to do in the last 45 minutes is just give an overview, an, an awareness of something. Um, but if a person really wants to understand it, it's a great endeavor to really approach the Gemara in such a manner to, to actually see the learning using the wealth of many, many commentaries that are used to, to Sephardi and Ashkenazi, by the way. It's not limited to only Sephardi Mefarshim, right? The Maharsha is a key component of learning, of understanding. I talked about Rashim Tosfot today, and the Maharsha is a key component of understanding in this way. And later authorities um, from Jerba, Tunis, and many other places, there is a wealth of commentaries that write great things and could teach the willing student to learn from the um, great amount of, of books available. Um, in approaching the Gemara this way. So I encourage everyone to take the time and to, if he really is interested in to take the time daily to devote time to Talmud study and to devote time to Talmud study according to our, uh, the approach of our Tamideh HaChamim Sefer Adim and to actually learn it in this manner. And I think then if you would come back and maybe re-listen to the lecture, a lot of things will become clearer. A lot of things will become uh, clarified. Um, I mentioned some, some works. I mentioned uh, Boyaron and Kampanton. Kampanton himself, Derech Talmud. It's not, a, it's not a large work. I would recommend it. Um, there is a, uh, Rabbi Mazuz has three articles in, in a book, Darche Hayun, which was published in his Kobitz Ma'amarim. And 
for those who have a hard time someone with reading the Hebrew, there's a tradition article. Um, I can give you the actual one second. I'll give you the actual publication date. Rob, this is perfect because you've essentially done the marketing for our membership mode when we're getting people to come and uh, learn Talmud exactly in this methodology. So. <laughs> in full 2013 of Tradition Magazine, there is an article by a, a person named Joseph Pringle, who actually a um, uh, PhD student in Near Eastern and Judaic Studies, who interviewed Rabbi Mazuz and summarized a lot of his approach in an English article in 20 pages. So that could be a beginning way to approach it. These are some reading materials, but I said, most importantly, get a teacher who's steeped in this way of learning and learn Gemara and study. That's the best way. I'll Sorry, can I, could, you, could you just repeat the volume, please, of, um, of tradition? I didn't catch it. Full 2013. Thank you. It's just been posted in the chat. Someone just posted the link there for that, that oh, yeah? tradition article. Okay, so thank you for that, Simon. Uh, Rav, thank you so, so much for that. I know you said you wanted to give some time for questions as well. Uh, I know you have to leave on the dot. Um, that was, I think, very helpful, very, very helpful, because something that we're trying to establish as a Beth Midrash is uh, not just looking at it from the macro level, but as you said, getting stuck in and actually uh, uh, studying it in depth, daily, weekly, uh, and, and that is the goal. So uh, beyond just giving an amazing show, you've essentially done all our marketing for us. So uh, thank you very much for that, Rav. Does anybody have any questions? Because I know I saw some in the chat. Uh, for the Rav. Yes, uh, please. Example, we mentioned before how Tosafot trying to unify the Sugyots, whereas Ravina Khananel and uh, some of the other commentaries understand that the different yeshivot, the different... Uh, different parts of the Gemara don't necessarily work together. I don't want to put you on the spot, but can you think of any examples in the in the commentaries where this is actually pointed out? Oh, uh, uh, I, I yeah, know, I, I can try and I could try and think of one right now, but um, I won't be able to take you through the whole sugya. But there is a an interesting uh, sugya of um, uh, where if I if I yes. There's a sugya which deals with the concept of davar um, And I, I can't give you the, the number, but maybe I'll try and call in and post the sugya after. And um, specifically over there, there's, a, there's a, two approaches. Um, on that sugya, we have a, sugya, a commentary of a Prima Brisk. Prima Brisk tries very hard to take these two sugyot, and on the spot, Rabbeinu Hananel says that the other sugya is following the approach of Rav, who holds a different halachan davar shenomit kaven as opposed to Shmuel. Um, I know this isn't so helpful because I don't have all the uh, off the cup off the cuff. I don't have all the um, uh, references, but um, and it is a little involved. But if I remember, I'll try and send someone the reference to that sugya, and that might be somewhat helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. Anybody else have any questions? Yes, Rob. Jack, I'm, sorry, I'll, I'll have to go ahead. Uh, the first principle that we went over was the fact that there's no missing language. There's no riddles. Um, but that's under the assumption that the person writing really followed this. But sometimes we do find poetic expressions in commentaries. We do say sometimes love dafka uh, to language. So when doesn't that... I Meaning it only works if the person is writing with that principle in mind. Right, so that is important to understand. So it's usually applied to um, legal texts. In other words, when we apply it to legal text, I mean, you're right, sometimes the Gemara itself, and it's and, and especially when we're dealing with Agada, we'll say Guzmak Tani, or something is, but when we're dealing with a legal text, for example, if you're dealing with the works of Maimonides and Ambam, we try and make that every word is crucial. In Rashi's commentary, we try as well to understand that Rashi himself is extre being extremely brief and focused. Um, there, there are times where we're forced to sometimes into a love dafka mode um, because, and then there are times, depending on the, the general context of the work, 
that some works may be more fluid or more poetic and those works, it's true, you may have that idea. But we're really focusing, when we mention this on some of the, um, the legal texts and the commentaries that are there to explain the text, i.e. Rashi. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, anybody else with their hands up? Any more questions? Isaac. Um, I find that oftentimes in the, in the yeshiva world that we that we learn Gemara, kind of shakla v'tariya, just go back and forth to to sort of just learn Gemara in order to, um, I don't know, help the brain think. Um, but the the way that I heard Chacham Vadya would learn the Gemara was to be psak din, to be posek the halacha from it. Does that come from the different ways, the different methodologies that we that we that we have between the Svaradim and the Ishkenazim, or is that not so much so, sure? So that's an interesting question, really. Um, as you noticed in my um, talk today, um, I really didn't didn't um, you know it's strange that when you took something about Svaradi and you didn't mention a on the entire hour, um, and I find myself someone who's highly influenced from all of Ahamavadiyah's writings and his teachings. Um, it is difficult to reconstruct a methodology of Iyun from Ahamavadiyah because so much of his work is focused on bringing it to the Halakha al And it is, even his works on Talmud that have been, you know, published um, uh, are tricky because they're so focused on bringing his, his extreme goal was to clarify halakha ma'aseh. So it is hard to reconstruct a method of gemara learning. It's possible to be done, but through Yabi Ahmed and through other words where you see how he's approaching the sujiyot, but you also have to remember that he was so focused on the goal of establishing halakha ma'aseh. And of course, the purpose and the large purpose of the writing of the Talmud is to come and to arrive at halakha la But as I mentioned in the beginning of my talk, that there are different, um, uh, uh, there are different studies and learning. And when you, one approach is to learn halakha and the sugya to the halakha, but then there is a validity to understand the depth of the sugya in itself, not just as a shakla v'tariya, which is just a, a kazooistry and to sharpen one's brain. I think that's a different approach uh, studied in yeshivot today in Ashkenazic method, but more in line of understanding and how to analyze and read a text, which can aid one in reading any text. A person fluent in Iyun will be more competent to learn Talmud. He'll be more competent to learn a bit Yosef. He'll be more competent to understand the in-depth point of a Yabi Omed, he'll be more competent to understand Haram Bam and, and, and anything. Anything he learns is by sharpening and fine tuning his analytical textual skills. Again, it's not just the Shak Levitaria. But again, and the reason of the avoidance of using a Hamuvaja in this guide, there is not Hasrashalam any disrespect to Hamuvaja because we drink his words in everything. It is because it is difficult to reconstruct a approach to Talmud it's extremely difficult to do that um, through his works, although it's possible. Thank you, Rav. Simon's got a question. Okay, this uh, yeah. one, last one. Uh, um, are there any online shirim that one can uh, get onto using this method? I know that Rav Mazuz has shirim, but unfortunately, I find his Hebrew rather hard to follow. Yeah. Is there any? And his, his Saturday night shirim really don't focus on Talmud. I think they focus on other topics. I am. Not aware of it off, off the hand. If I do find, I guess I'll be in contact and see if I find any links. It'll be interesting. I'm sure there's got to be, but I'm just not aware right now of them. But well, they will be with us from July onwards. And yeah. we're going to have to get Rabbi Sutton back as well to, to aid in that. Um, Rabbi Sutton, I know you, you, uh, you have to go. I really, really, really appreciate 
uh, that wonderful yeah i'm sorry just, just an introduction we're about to go pray minha right now so i gotta yeah no yeah. absolutely beyond just an introduction but uh, uh thank you very very much for that and everybody who's here thank you all for making it we look forward to seeing you next week uh rabbi Dweck continuing the series on hacham sham top gagin uh again big thank you to sca and rabbi harold sutton for this unique and very memorable shiur and we're looking forward to use it as a springboard to Drink from the waters of this methodology, please God, as the Beth Midrash develops. So uh, I think Rabbi Dweck has actually just quickly joined the waiting room. He did want to quickly thank you himself. Okay. If you have a couple of minutes, Rav. Sure, go ahead. you're here? I'm here. Did I ah. miss the whole thing? <laughs> we were just closing. Um, the Rav has to go, but yeah, it's okay. perfect time. So I won't hold him too long, Hacham. I'm so grateful for your taking the time and for sharing. And I've been getting text messages through the, uh, through the shiur saying how unbelievable it is. And it's Thank beautiful you. to see everyone. I see who's here and it's good that they're all here. I'm very grateful that everybody's taken the time. You've been enriched tonight from a great Talmud Hacham and a very, very dear friend and mentor. Thank you, Hacham Ilil. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Rabbi Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, enjoyed it it's very our much. Our honor. It's our honor. We're okay. going to need you more, Rabbi Sutton. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Just the beginning. Just the beginning. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Bye bye. Call to. Call to.